Radio. You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. And good morning or good afternoon to all you out there, whatever the case may be. You are here live with Dr. Jeff Werber, your host here on Pet Life Radio's live call-in show, Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff. And um, we're uh, here with a special guest today, Sarah Hodgson. We'll get to talk to Sarah in just a second. Hope you had a good week. I hope you're braving the weather. It is, oh my God, I, was, I, I think I told you I was at Super Zoo in Las Vegas about a, a week ago, and oh, braving weathers of 110 degrees and higher. Here in Southern California, we've been in the hundreds, so make sure you keep your pets safe. Make sure that they have plenty of water, plenty of shade, and if you keep them inside, that's even better. Uh, and if you're going to exercise them, make sure it's only going to be early, early in the morning or late in the evening and watch their feet. Make sure they have uh, plenty of water and plenty of rest stops. No running marathons with your dogs during this time of year, that's for sure. And want to uh, thank our sponsors, ProSense Pet Products, Kong Veterinary Products. Kong is, is one of our newer sponsors, and uh, this show is brought to you by them and More Than a Cone which is raising awareness for animal wellness through the arts. It's a great campaign that KVP is doing. Also, Save This Life Microchip. Big fan of that, especially microchipping this time of year when you're probably going to be out and about with your dogs and going to the dog parks and doing all the stuff you do. There's a big chance for them to get away from you. So make sure they have both an internal ID and an external ID. Don't count on just one or the other. Better yet, have them both. And... Also, we work with Comfortis. We're working with Provecto now. So uh, a lot of good stuff. Anyway, so we're here today with Sarah Hodgson. Sarah is a very well-known behaviorist, trainer, I, I think over more than 30 years in the biz, and um, also an author. And um, I actually got to read and review Modern Dog Parenting, which is her new book, which is now out, I believe. And um, anyway, Sarah, welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be on, on live with you, Jeff. So tell us, uh, first of all, let's give it a little bit about your background. Here's your opportunity to just kind of let it all out and, uh, and toot your own horn. That's totally fine because we're here for us. <laughs> you can say anything you want. I've always loved dogs, and ever since about the age of six, I was just addicted to leading them around and directing them, and I always felt that they were like little children. I never really felt that they were all that much different than we are, and so I had a big band of dogs around my neighborhood, and I started my uh, official business when I was 19 and still in college to be a veterinarian. And much to my parents' chagrin, I didn't pursue veterinary school much beyond my senior year at Michigan State. And I just started training dogs, and I've never stopped. I got my first book when I was quite young with a, with a veterinarian. And, and my philosophy is simply treat them like children, teach them English as a second language. I created um, a home and a land with a multi-species household that we call Doglandia. We have foster dogs that are in, some stay forever, some go out. We have pets and rabbits and kids. I, I toss in a husband in there, and we just have a lot of fun. And I just go around helping people understand that the dogs just want to know what you expect from them. You teach them English just like they were a foreign exchange student, and, and they respond. And they'll love you forever if they can understand what you want them to do. That, that's an added bonus. And have you ever, in working with dogs, you know, I, as a veterinarian, I hear the tough stories. I just worked with a family recently that we had a beautiful, absolutely stunning, stunning Australian Shepherd that is great with most everybody and great in most circumstances. However, there have been a number of circumstances where this dog literally, become, it's a Jekyll and Hyde, unpredictable. They have no idea what this, the trigger is, whether it's with a person or persons, or just the other day, another dog, on the, two dogs on the street, two elderly women walking there, two very well-behaved, believe it or not, Irish setters, something that we don't see very much anymore, that yeah. breed, and this dog went ballistic. So, but the dog is still young, and way too, it's a beautiful dog. I mean, absolutely one of the best Australian Shepherd, just a great representation of the breed. Anyway, so they are going to be rehoming right now with the trainer to find out what is the trigger of this dog. Why does he go from that mixed personalities? Have you ever had a dog that you just couldn't train or at least not train in the current 
environment that it was in and recommended maybe you know, this is a great dog but it's the wrong situation. Well, you bring up a lot of interesting points. With Australian Shepherds, they're a herding breed and herding right. breeds by nature are obsessive compulsive and they're very territorial because they are bred to be on a farm doing the same routine with sheep day in and day out. And with shepherding dogs, they also will see their family as either sheep or shepherds. And if they are sheep, then they are going to distinguish based on their own criteria what constitutes a threat to their herd. So it's okay that the dog's being sent out, but the dog's probably going to see the trainer as a shepherd and may return trained for that trainer, but adapting to the same household with the same set of triggers. So if I were working with a person, and I do work on Skype, and I do phone sessions, and, and I do bring a certain different way of looking at problems than people have experienced with other trainers, I would ask them really to write down where these situations are happening and when. I find that a lot of people have been mis- informed that leash walking is a necessity for having a happy dog and that excessive exercise makes for a happy family. Now you spoke of something which is critically important and I want to underscore it for your listeners in that dogs, no matter what the heat is, really are crepuscular animals. They need to sleep during the day. A mature dog, correct me if you've heard otherwise, will sleep 75% of the day. And the exercise that it needs is in the morning and in the evening, not all day long, not leashed walks. Dogs, this whole leash walking is a relatively new invention in the human-dog relationship, and dogs are not bred to walk in a linear fashion, especially herding breeds. So what I see and what I do with herding breeds is I train them basically off-leash. When we go to the home, the home is equal to a den. So to a dog, the home is their den, the yard is their territory, everything else is the world beyond. When people start taking their dog on leash walks around a gigantic neighborhood or around a two-yard block, the dog, if that dog is taken that far, is going to perceive a very big territory and grow to protect it. So I would recommend some different things, but I, you know, I don't want to take up the whole show talking on and on about this. So yeah, I just wanted to know. So there are, you know, we had a dog when I was five. My parents thought it would be really cool. My dad fell in love with this Doberman Pinscher mm -hmm. that was a 11 months old, intact, and off the show circuit for whatever one reason or another. It it didn't uh, seem to make the cut for this right. breeder. Right. So the dog's sister lived down the block and litter mate, and we, um, my dad adopted this dog. So he brings this dog into a home with four kids. I was five, sister seven, and then three and two, and um, a magnificent dog, really was a magnificent dog. But when I happened to walk in the house, this was living in New York, I was all bundled up, it was just during the winter, and I think, because I was only five, I didn't really pay much attention, I think, what we all think is I must have stepped on him while he was sleeping in the hallway. And out of reflex, he decided to jump up and protect himself, which happened to be the brunt of that protection was my face. So, so there I was, literally got me, I mean, plastic surgery the whole bit. But we knew that he really was a good dog. But, man, you don't put a dog who's been on a show circuit, probably never seen a kid, right? And they're very reactive. You know, they're, they're very alert. Dobermans in general are. And you put them in a house of four little toddlers and, um, where who knows what can happen. So we ended up rehoming him down the block with the elderly couple with no children right. left. They were older kids, and he got to live out his very uh, happy life with his littermate sister and this old, this old family. We got to visit, yeah. but it was you know sometimes I think what's the expression? There's really no bad dog. Sometimes it's like the bad situation, the bad environment. But dogs and people have to realize that that yeah. you be very careful when. Like, for example, all the things you were just talking about, the nature of an Australian Shepherd. And many dogs have their nature, whatever that nature might be. So when you are considering a dog or you're adopting from a shelter even, you need to know what are the normal personality inbred traits of this breed or breeds. And in the case of a rescue, it's probably a mix. And proceed cautiously and accordingly. Even though the dog may look gorgeous, it may not be the right dog for your situation. And, and understand that if it doesn't work out, the fate 
of some of these dogs is really not pleasurable. Right. So right. these are things we have to, you know, take into consideration also. Also, just the people, you know, out there, you know, if you have any questions for Sarah, an amazing, amazing dog trainer, behaviorist, uh, you can give us a call at 877-385-8882 or join us online, PetLifeRadio.com. Click on the Ask the Vets tab with Dr. Jeff and you go, you could scroll down to find my link. And then in our little page, you will see a link for Google Hangouts and you can actually join us live right here as Sarah has done with me. And if you go onto Google Hangouts, it's really cool. And the link is on our page on Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff. Anyway, don't go away. We are at that halfway point here in the show. And uh, we are going to be right back after a word from our sponsors, both our show and Pet Life Radio as well. We'll be right back. We'll be right back, right after these messages. Stay tuned. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com This is my tired of itching face. Does your dog suffer from persistent itching and scratching? Allergies and skin irritations caused by environment, including pollens, insects, especially fleas, food and common household allergens are common problems in dogs. It's easy to alleviate your dog's discomfort at home with ProSense. ProSense itch and allergy products provide fast relief from symptoms like itchy, irritated skin, skin infections like hot spots and watery eyes. ProSense products are veterinary formulated and recommended to ensure the very best for your pet. Try ProSense today. Your dog will thank you for it. Pets love life. Love them back with ProSense. Are you having trouble getting the word out about your new pet product or invention? Let Whitegate PR open the gate to your marketing and public relations efforts. We've been specializing in public relations in the pet industry for over a decade. From press releases to media relations and publicity to pet trade shows and launch events to social media, the pet-friendly team at Whitegate PR has you covered. If you listen to the wise words of Bill Gates, he says, If I had $1 left, I'd spend it on PR. Learn more at whitegatepr.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> And welcome back. You are here live with Dr. Jeff Gerber, your host here on Life Radio. Dr. Jeff, and along with my guest, Sarah Hodgson, author, trainer. And uh, Sarah, so you have this new book, uh, Modern Dog Parenting. Um, that is, is, it due, is it out already? It comes out September 6th. September 6th. Okay, write that down. September 6th, Modern Dog Parenting by Sarah Hodgson. So tell us about the book. Tell us what prompted you to write another one. You have one before that. Was it The Pledge? What, what, you have a couple of books out there, huh? I think I have about 12 out there. Several with the Gummy series and then some others with Hal. So I took a little break to raise my family and I really felt the niche for people to understand it's not really training, it's more parenting. It's more structure, reinforcement, consistency, and positive parenting. So I approached my agent who reached out and I found a home for my book with St. Martin Press. We are putting up daily tips on my Facebook page, which is facebook.com, Wine Dogs Talk. And all these tips really point out the parallel between raising dogs and children. Dogs really want to know two things. They want to know where am I supposed to go and what am I supposed to do when Things happen when people come in the house, when you're eating, when you're watching TV. Where am I supposed to go? What am I supposed to do? And it boils down to a few simple reinforceable habits that you can create. 
put a mat in the room to share. Make sure you have a bone or a busy toy that your dog can be preoccupied with. Understand the importance of sleep training, which I talk about in the book, and a few other tips that I go over in the book. And it's it's a fun read. A few people said it reads like a mystery, and I think you gave me one of the mm -hmm. highest compliments. They told me to use it at your home, and I felt so happy. <laughs> Now, have you ever met a dog that people follow everything, you've worked with them, and still it's just not working? It's interesting because I tell people, people want me to move in the minute they meet me. I'm, I love people. I love dogs. I love kids. And I say, well, I'll work with you. And I either do day training where I come in three or four times during the week when the people aren't there and transfer over or coach them. And I say, but if it takes you more than a month, to see change, to get this right, it's not the right dog for you. And passing a dog on, if you're so frustrated with the dog that it's bringing about anger and frustration, and you're working and following what I'm saying for a month, it's in your dog's interest to find it a home where it's happy. Because a dog that misbehaves, it's not happy. It's unsettled. And you know what? I rarely have any clients that rehome their dog. They come up to the table, they follow what I tell them to do. Dogs love to learn, and when you do it right, you use positive reinforcement, and you're encouraging, and you give them places to go, and do what I encourage. It works, and people see change within one, one hour of my being there. It's not that hard to change a dog's behavior if you're willing to change your own behavior. No, you say something very interesting, and I've, I've noticed I've never had this with my dogs. And I have five right now, and they're amazing. I mean, you know, my, my yellow lab is a little is still a puppy, a five-year-old puppy. I'm hoping by seven he'll settle. But my, my Labradoodle is, is you know, extremely, extremely well-behaved and trained. And my Frenchie's totally my black lab, who's now 15 and a half, which is highly remarkable for a Labrador. So, but my yellow lab is, as I said, he's got a screw loose or two. But he's got, you know, as they said, one thing about labs, what they lack in brain they make up for in heart, and he is just the, the sweetest thing, and all he wants to do is please. But I've had this problem more in the past with cats, and I've had to rehome two over the years. Interestingly, and uh, for those of you listening out there, don't hate me, but they were both females, and I find that in multi, multi-pet households, of which mine is one because I have six cats with my five dogs, and that the male cats seem to be just better adjustable. In other words, they seem to adjust better to the insanity, the craziness. They're more secure in their own skin. And I've tried on two occasions to bring a female into the mix and the female would just, I mean, she would hide all the time. She, would, she wouldn't use a litter box because she was afraid to go out. She was afraid of the dogs. And the dogs, the dogs are used to cats. They live with six of them. They don't care of another cat. Every, every new cat I brought in, the dogs think, oh my God, a new toy. But understand, you made a really good point. Sometimes if it's not working out for you, trust me, it's probably not working out for your pet either. So you don't necessarily have to feel guilty. I, uh, actually, you know, it did happen once with it. I tried to rescue a corgi. I love corgis and, again, hurting dogs by nature. Well, at the time, I had two very large, relatively impatient Labradors when it came to a little corgi. And all this corgi wanted to do was herd my labs. Literally, and you know, if, if any of you will watch corgis in action, obviously they're not big enough. Like a Rottweiler, take a shoulder and like a football player into the, or, or to yap around and bark. They're healers, and they nip at the feet, and that's how they get these big animals, the cows, the sheep, to change direction. This little corgi was all day long running after my dogs and nipping at their feet, and they were saying, would you cut that, you know, get off of me already. And then it was starting to be like a little more of aggressive. Well, anyway, one of my clients had a corgi and asked me, she goes, you know what? I want to get another corgi. I said, wait a sec, time out. Do I have the dog for you? And uh, I took little Calvin and Calvin moved in and it was like the best thing that ever happened. Calvin was the happiest dog. He had another dog just like him to play with. And, uh, and they live happily ever after. So the only thing I would caution you is taking the dog back to a shelter. Try to rehome because often, unfortunately, uh, if that dog ends up back in a shelter, its fate is not a good one. But yeah. if you can rehome, take your time, work with a trainer, and do the best you can, it might end up you know, much better for both of you. So if you had to like narrow down, for example, let's talk about something that I hear all the time. 
that one of the bigger problems, it's not aggression, it's not misbehaving, it's separation anxiety. If you can just, I know it's a, it's tough because there's so many factors that go in to dogs that have separation anxiety, but you, I've heard stories about literally the owner leaving the house and the neighbor saying within five minutes, the dog is yapping, running, you can just hear all this stuff. First of all, why? What is the problem there? Give me a quick Cliff Notes oh, solution. Yeah. Yeah, well, I just wrote a piece for the Huffington Post on separation anxiety, and I blogged there. If you can imagine a two- to three-year-old child being locked away from its parents while they ran errands, then you can understand the frenzy of a dog who is anxious by nature, does not like to be left alone, hate silence. This is something people don't recognize. Silence frightens a dog. It's very unsettling. So some of the quick solutions I give to people when I'm Skyping or over the phone, I ask them to revert back is find out what triggers the anxiety. Link it to something the dog loves, tug of war, game, a game I call Find It, where I throw treats on the floor and say find it. It's really not more complicated than that, although I have a video on YouTube. You throw treats, you say find it, and you ring the doorbell, or you grab your purse and you play find it with some bits of turkey or some high-end treats the dog loves. So you list all your triggers, you link it with things the dogs enjoy, don't follow the trigger with leaving, just one by one, kind of link up the triggers. When you go, go for short departures. I love this pet acoustic cube. I have seven of them in the house. The kids love them too. And it plays this kind of petsy, groovy, new agey music that the dogs seem to like. It fills the house with music. I turn that on, I feed them their meals. So they start hearing this music and thinking they're getting fed. Then when I leave the house, I put that music on and I give them a puppy pacifier. I have a funny YouTube video of creating puppy pacifiers with food and little treat bits. I give them a puppy pacifier and go out for five minutes. When you come back in, and this is so important, if the dog, if your dog is anxious, don't reconnect right away. Come in, put your purse down, ignore your dog, give them a bone or something to fester chew on, and don't look or reconnect to them until they're not anxious. Otherwise, you're reinforcing the anxiety. And if your dog's done something wrong or something you think's wrong, chewed up a slipper or peed or pooped or done some god-awful thing, who cares? Life is so short. Don't pay attention because if you get angry at your dog, you're increasing the anxiety. If they're destructive and putting them in a crate makes them frantic, enclose them in a room. Use a pen or enclose them in a room with a double gate if they'll scale it. Put their puppy pacifier down, limit the destruction, and come in. Don't let them out of that area until they calm down from the anxiety. Woo! How's that for an elevator pitch? That was perfect. Perfect. That's great. So um, where can we find more about you, what you do? You, you mentioned you have some of these things on YouTube. Uh, you're blogging on Huffington Post. Uh, if somebody wants to hear or read or learn some more of how they can make their dog the perfect dog, join that realm of modern dog parenting, Woo! then... Uh, then uh, how do we find you? They can go right to my website, which is When Dogs Talk, w, obviously, www.whendogstalk.com. They can connect with all my social media channels. I'm kind of everywhere, and I have lots of YouTube videos. They can go on there, and Facebook, there's all sorts of things posted there, and they'll see me liking you and you liking me, and it will be easy to find us both. And how do you, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you to actually use your services as a behaviorist, a trainer, how would they go about that? They On my website, When Dogs Talk, you'll see Work With Sarah, and there's an easy form to fill out, Skype, or if they're in the tri-state area, there's an easy form to fill out. It'll come to me, and I'll get right in touch. And now you said Skype. Have you found it that it can be effective even though you're not personally there? Oh, Yeah. Oh, and, and I teach people things that they've never, they say they've never heard before, and, and a lot of posturing can be done right in front of the computer camera. So it's nice, I can come in there, and there's a lot of modern technology, so I'll ask them to use their phone to, to videotape the dog or to videotape them working with their dog, and I can just analyze quickly, you know. A lot of times people stare at dogs, and what, what I help people understand is that humans are the only people that think Staring and smiling at each other is a positive thing. To a dog, it can really shut them down. So I can teach a simple skill of when you're trying to tell your dog to do something, say and show them. Don't say and stare. And don't run at your dog. You're scaring your dog. They can't learn that way. It's simpler to leave on a little leash 
or to use a little treat cup to call them over so that they grab something you don't want them to grab. They come and give it to you or just run away with it. Uh, one last real quick thing. It's a yes or no answer because I had Stanley Corn on a couple of weeks ago. Do you hug your dogs? Oh, yeah. I hug them all the time. I do. But I also have a little thing in my book that says, here's how you condition your dog to love hugs. I even have a video on YouTube, how to teach your dog to love hugs. Okay. Because I told Stanley I was shocked when I, I read that report, his study, because my dogs, and, and I have a lot of patients that literally jump up on me. They love to be hugged. Yeah. So, all right. Anyway, Sarah, thank you so much for joining me here on Pet Life Radio's Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff. Um, hopefully, we'll, um, well, we can have you on soon. If, I, we, if, there's a, if there's ever something that you know, like I'd be really interested to talk about some of your like top five problems that people call you about. And then we'll have you back on the show, and we'll run through each one and um, just give solutions to people because I guarantee if you're getting them as a top five, then there are enough of our listeners out there are having the same problems. Wow. So, uh, and it's like, you know, they, 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 have, they, they want the answers. They're just afraid to ask. All right. Anyway, once again, thanks to our sponsors, Kong, Veterinary Product, ProSense, um, Save This Life Microchip, um, and uh, Comfortis, maybe hopefully soon to be Perfecto. It's a, it's a great product. They're both fantastic. And uh, we will see you here live. Uh, next week on Ask Vets with Dr. Jeff. Um, have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sarah. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.